Over the past decade, the relationship between people and government has become increasingly frayed. A series of global shocks have shaken citizens' trust in their government's ability to adapt to meet their changing needs, and the power to drive change continues to rest in the hands of relatively few. In 2020, the COVID-19 crisis has brought into sharp focus the need for government to work differently. Until now, much of the debate around government and public service reform is about what government should do, how services should be structured, how performance should be tracked, or how decisions should be made. However, the damaged relationship between government and citizens is proof that not enough emphasis has been placed to date on how government should be, the beliefs and principles that drive government action. But there is hope. Changemakers at different levels of government and in frontline public services around the world are pioneering a new vision for government based on three core beliefs. First, that most of the challenges we face as a society are complex in nature. Second, that the quality of human relationships matters a great deal. And third, that progress is best achieved through experimentation and a process of continuous learning. These beliefs have given rise to a new set of values and principles that serve as a useful guide for the future of government, particularly as leaders are grappling with how to rebuild a post-COVID society. They call on government leaders to think systematically, but act locally, share power with those best placed to act, challenge unnecessary hierarchy and collaborate across boundaries, seek out strengths and build on them, champion the voices of those who are heard the least, and optimise for learning rather than control. While the disconnect between government and people has been growing for some time, the COVID-19 recovery presents a powerful opportunity for us to close that gap and reimagine government so that it works for everyone. Are you part of the growing movement to reimagine government? Join the conversation. Good morning and good afternoon for some. Welcome everyone. My name is Kaval Hanna. I'm the Director of Economic Mobility at the Center for Public Impact, a nonprofit that works with public servants and other change makers to reimagine government and turn ideas into impact for all people. Before we jump into today's session, I'd just like to say a few words. At CPI, we believe that the relationship between people and government has become increasingly frayed. In the US in particular, this has been exasperated by the dual crises of the COVID-19 pandemic and social unrest. And these crises have exposed vast differences in economic stability. For us at CPI, and for probably many of you on the line, we believe that there is a need to reimagine existing economic models that can, can address these differences and rebuild post crises. To that end, our Inclusive Economies team in North America, in partnership with the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, have been working to build and drive change towards just that. Today's agenda. Um, we'll focus on a few things. First, we'll share our definition and framework for an inclusive economy. We'll hear real life examples from practitioners, explore barriers to implementation, and focus on the importance of collaboration. There will be a few interactive polls throughout the session, and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. During the session, if you have questions or comments, please drop them in the chat as we'll be compiling and addressing them in the Q&A at the end of the session. So I'll now hand it over to my partner and colleague, Arturo Franco, VP of Data and Insights at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you, Keval. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And thank you everyone for joining us. When the global pandemic uh, started back in March, we knew two things were bound to happen. The first, which was clear from the beginning, was that the economic shocks that we were about to experience would have a bigger impact on those whose economic and financial security was already at risk. I'm talking about low wage service workers, small businesses, particularly those that could not go digital, micro merchants in the developing world. So this crisis was going to lay bare some of the weaknesses of our economy. But the second was that this terrible year actually had some sort of silver lining. It gave us the opportunity to ask deeper, 
more structural questions about our economy. See, when the world is growing, when you're at full employment, when the stock market seems to be peaking, nobody really wants to change anything. But this year was different. And we started asking ourselves, what should we change about our economic systems? Let's start uh, by acknowledging that we are not just at the end of the longest economic expansion in human history, which lasted for 128 months until COVID hit. We have also just experienced an economy that over a few decades lifted billions out of poverty. On average, we saw record improvements in health, literacy, nutrition, rising living standards, significant advances in technology and innovation. But as we all know very well, the benefits of this economic growth did not reach everyone. Large segments of the population and many places in both developing and developed countries did not rise with the tide. And many people around the world are struggling more than ever perhaps with financial security, with job fragility, with access to opportunity. And this is why in the head office of many international organizations like the OECD, in corporate boardrooms, but also in government offices across local, state, and national jurisdictions. People are asking themselves the same question. How can we build a more inclusive and a better economy? Now, before I go on, I'd like to ask you uh, to engage with us um, with the following question. And on the screen, you can see how you can help us answer it. In your community, which forms of economic exclusion have been most exacerbated by the global pandemic or by social unrest. And you can do so um, uh, with this system and melty.com. So as you, as you answer the poll um, and we get some, some results here, um, let me tell you what we did uh, during the last few months. So as Keval was saying, back in March, we launched this project together with the Center for Public Impact to ask leading experts from all walks of life, from Nobel Prize winning uh, economists to heads of international organizations, to community leaders and people on the front lines of our economy, uh, like the ones we're gonna speak to today, how can we fix our economy? And we summarized our results in a report called Built for All. Um, and what's interesting about this collective framework is that many of the conversations that we had actually went very deep into the fundamental principles behind our economy. So we discussed things about what is the source of exclusion of our economy. And here we can see uh, people saying uh, job fragility and financial security and declining legitimacy and trust in government as two of the sources. So we went through many of this um, during our discussions. But we also uh, realized that, you know, there were some things in our economy that, that were not working right. So we built an economy that was made for growth, but sometimes at the expense of equity. That we built an economy that was made for efficiency, but not for resilience. That we had an economy that was great for creating tons and tons of jobs, but again, sometimes at the expense of human dignity. And when you start putting all of these things together, and thank you for answering uh, the poll, you realize that you know, the question is, why can't we have both? Why can't we have both prosperity and opportunity? Why can't we have both economic progress and sustainability? And it turns out that we can if you change the frame um, by which we think and design and build our economic systems. So we arrived at this framework, um, which is basically just a way to organize the conversation into three parts. First, how can we ensure that people have equal access to resources and opportunities that they need to participate in the economy? And we're gonna hear uh, about this from the panel. Second, how can we make sure that there is fairness uh, for workers and businesses? that there are no artificial barriers out there, that folks are rewarded equally for the same work. And finally, 
how do we make sure that this economy, an inclusive economy, carries on into the future, that we are bringing the next generation into consideration? So to finish, I'm going to ask you to do another poll now that you've got practice. And I would like you uh, to tell us in your work and in your community, what are the biggest barriers that you face in making the economy work for everyone? Is it short-termism? Is it some kind of behavior that you feel needs to change? Is it funding that's the issue? Is it inertia? Uh, people kind of caught up in the same frame, frameworks of the past. Uh, we'd love to know. And so to finish, we hope that this built for all framework, and please use the hashtag built for all, can be useful in guiding your conversations about how to build a better, more inclusive economy. And I'm very excited for our panel today because I talked about boardrooms and headquarters of international organizations, but the real conversations, the important conversations, the ones that really, really make a difference are the ones that happen with the folks that are trying to tackle these questions in their day-to-day -day work. And we have uh, an amazing group of people that do just that. So thank you again, very excited to be here and um, keep, keep, keep the, the questions coming. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Arturo. And just a quick introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Shapiro. I'm a senior associate at the Center for Public Impact. I'm one of your moderators today, along with my colleague, Megan Humes. So just jumping in here to hand over the stage to Jeremiah Gracia, the Director for Economic Development for the City of Grand Rapids, to be the first um, speaker sharing a government perspective in terms of his work toward building inclusive economies. And then we'll continue on hearing some stories from both the private and the civic sector as well. So Jeremiah, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Gracia. I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Economic Development for the City of Grand Rapids, which is in Western Michigan. So I'd like to give you an overview uh, of the city for, for some perspective. So next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, we are located in Western Michigan. Um, we are Michigan's second largest city, and we frequently top the best of lists, best place to live, best place to live, you name it. And you can see some of those things that I've highlighted on the right side of the screen. Now, West Michigan is a growing region of more than 1.5 million people and has a, a very diverse set of folks with the largest population being African-American and Latinx um, in the urban core. Now, we pride ourselves on being a business-friendly environment and, and certainly have collaborative public-private partnerships, but we know that the successes and the best of lists have come at a cost. And I'm gonna share with you today the action steps that we have taken intentionally for strategy to um, build a better and inclusive economy in Western Michigan and be, do our part as it relates to the Midwest, the United States, and hopefully the globe as we're uh, presenting today. So next slide. So I wanna set what kind of a reset to make sure we understand what we're talking about here um, and how we talk to our stakeholders to make sure they understand when we're talking about equality and equity as we look at our equitable economic development plan. So these pictures pr provide you some context of that and saying, look, the first picture on the left is certainly everyone being treated equally. The same size support box, the same size um, mechanisms, but as you can see, there's one person on the right there that, that is not able to see over the fence, if you will. As you move to the right, you'll see this is what equality is about in being and treating people equitably. We put some support mechanisms in place so that it's possible for those folks to have equal access to view the same game or development or de business de or uh, uh, incentives or assistance that they need to be successful. Now, if you do the equitable piece right and you move to the far right, you will eventually remove a systemic barrier that has required you to put all those other support mechanisms. And to be honest with you, made you put more time and effort and lift than you necessarily may need it to do because you hadn't looked at the root cause and that's what we're trying to do with our equitable economic development strategy. So let's move into that. Next, next slide, please. So um, I was fortunate to join this team 
in March of 2020. That's right. Um, I was interviewing during the beginning of this pandemic, but the reason that I took this opportunity to come to Grand Rapids from the Columbus, Ohio market was because of what you see on the screen here, this equitable economic development and mobility strategic plan. Without this plan, there is no doubt that I would not have considered this position in the time that we're in or any other time, because I realized that the city had taken very intentional focus on building an inclusive economy, but more importantly, have got had a plan approved with community stakeholders. So I'm gonna talk very quickly on the three main items. So what it is, why it matters, and how we are already using it to retain, expand, and attract businesses. Next slide. So at a high level, how are we doing this? I would not, I, I cannot stress enough that's important about this is the equitable economic development and mobility. It should not be dismissed that we work focused our work with our mobile GR team because mobility is a huge factor in increasing the likelihood of success of equitable economic development practices and principles um, for a city. So let's talk about that. So first, one of the biggest ones is equal, uh, expand the access to opportunity and support economic competitiveness. Again, if you go back to that picture that I, that I started the presentation with, our goal is to provide the support mechanisms now because that's where we are. We know that work needs to be done, but at the end of the day, have remove a systemic barrier. And we know that in order to do that, it's gonna take very, very intentional support systems to expand the access to opportunity that otherwise had not been able to be accessed or folks were not in, aware of how they could access uh, access those resources, which we'll talk about a little later. Secondly, enhance uh, mobility and safety. Getting people to a job is what we realize is a huge barrier, even when they do are, are, do, are provided a job. Sometimes they're, they're relying on someone else to give them a job or they can't afford, based on the pay they're receiving, to own a vehicle, or they do own a vehicle and things like car maintenance or other issues um, prohibits them from getting the job on a regular basis and sometimes impacts their ability to keep the job. And last but not least, promoting an inclusive growth, promoting inclusive growth and access to city services. So again, not only are we doing this from our uh, equitable economic development plan, but the city of Grand Rapids strategic plan has a focus lens on equity. So everything that we're doing at providing city services um, has an equitable focus on it. And in fact, we've stood up a, a, a department called the Office of Equity and Engagement to ensure that all decision policies and programmatic and policy and budgetary have an equity lens to them and making sure that they're a part of that conversation and that perspective so that those that oversight is um, minimized. Next slide. So the focus areas of this plan. So we call it the EEDMSP, right? It's a mouthful, but it's uh, something that we use. But here's the key areas that I want to highlight. Business development. Not just business development in the sense for having new business, but more importantly, um, influencing the way that the businesses that we work with and are attracting have the same values and expectations that we, are, that we have as a city as it relates to building inclusive economies. So some of that is providing some of their assistance in business development to help them open up their uh, talent pipelines to those underserved, underrepresented communities. And they're just not sure how to do so, where to find them and how to provide support services around it. Real estate development. This is important in, in the sense of how we are incentivizing um, changed behavior and investments in what we call neighborhoods of focus. So not just providing financial support and incentives because the, pro the, the program um, meets the minimum requirements, but raising the bar and saying, hey, we want you to have a MBE, MLBE um, a sourcing uh, contract behind it to help those minority contracts be part of real estate development. And more importantly, we've changed policies to increase investment reimbursements uh, programs in those neighborhoods of focus. So instead of just getting a 50% reimbursement, if you are one, a first time developer, um, and you're investing in a neighborhood of focus, your reimbursements for sort of, for example, site evaluation can go up to 100%. Neighborhood business districts. This is really important. While we can provide strategy and um, programs and, and uh, financial incentives, it's important that the, neighbor, the neighbors and the businesses within them are invested partners as well. 
They need to be driving and informing the decisions on where development is taking place. And we're giving them opportunity to become business owners and property owners, more importantly, for long-term sustainable wealth for their business and for their um, uh, overall uh, family for generations to come. Transportation, vision zero and parking. Again, all related to mobility uh, uh, processes and that we're building in, for example, transportation management to make sure that incremental development is serviced and uh, adequately serviced by um, transportation uh, needs for those folks to make sure that um, they have access, equal access to the uh, public transportation system and can get to and from a job on a regular basis. Next slide. So how are we doing this? So these five objectives that we have here are the commitments that we've made to um, our, in our five year strategic plan. And so I'm gonna cover these very briefly. First, information. What we found and what we know, it's very difficult to make sure that all the right folks and all the right um, communication uh, channels are used effectively and translation services are used effectively to ensure that people understand what um, services and resources are available to the, to the business community. So what's, for example, on our Southeast side of town, we found it's really important that we have trans, everything translated into Spanish, vitally important. There's no assumptions that they can understand what the English application or marketing material says, and we may, need to make sure, and it helps us come to meet them in their space and they understand and can share the information with their networks about what's available for their um, uh, business development purposes. Incentives, I mentioned about this, not creating incentives for the sake of creating incentives, but changing policy behind it that changes behavior and where those investments and influence where those investments are taking place that um, unfortunately fill the gap of those areas of, of the city that haven't been able to take advantage as we've heard uh, in the introduction today, as much as other places in the city and been left behind, frankly. And so we know that there's a lot of um, uh, um, available property and there's a lot of redevelopment available. And we know that there's jobs and more importantly, we're aligning ourselves to the businesses that want to be in those areas that have programs that want to invest in those neighborhoods of focus and providing them additional assistance. And again, incentivizing their behavior to invest in those areas. Small business goes without saying the small business is a lifeblood of every community. Um, but we also know that those small business and we found very, very um, clear during this pandemic, um, they just aren't um, perhaps um, in a right place to even uh, uh, and access financial means available because they haven't um, done some foundational things like have strong accounting practices and, and or profit and loss statements and other things that are necessary to apply for these financial assistance programs. And we realized that the support network, again, if you remember the support network of, of equity wasn't in place. And so we're building that now with various community partners like our Hispanic Chamber, our Grand Rapids Area Black Business Association, our Asian American Association and the like. Neighborhoods. Neighborhood incremental development is very, very important. We need to, we are reducing barriers to development and providing technical assistance to those folks that want to move from renting their business storefront to owning their business storefront and other property within the surrounding area so that, that the, the development itself is informed by a neighborhood resident. And again, it's wealth creation within the neighborhood. And um, again, we are um, providing the, the technical assistance through incentive programs specifically designed for those neighborhoods of focus. Economic growth. All these roll into the, the last item, which is economic growth in terms of making sure that our economy continues to grow, but we don't grow in the same way that we traditionally have and have um, and minimize, if not eliminate, leaving certain parts of our community behind. And it's very, very it's, it's a heavy lift, but we know it's the right thing to do and we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. And it's a huge shift in terms of our community thinking about the long-term game in the current pandemic, which has a lot of, sh uh, that people want short-term solutions, immediate solutions, but we know we gotta make decisions now that set us better up for the long-term. So coming out of this pandemic um, is, uh, we're in a better spot. And so what I would say is this, the 
equitable economic development plan principles, pandemic or not, when it was approved in January 2020, those principles apply to even through this pandemic now because those were, were doing the right things for the right reasons. Now, we'll see what happens in the next uh, six to 12 months as we continue to work through this pandemic. Well, we're, we know we have a solid foundation to work off of a strategic plan. And more importantly, we have citizen and business community buy-in and we're using those folks to multiply our reach. So thank you for listening. Look forward to seeing you in Grand Rapids soon. And thank you to CPI for supporting us in our work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. And in some of the stories that you were telling here, I can already see a lot of themes connecting with what the audience members were polling about um, earlier in the, in the introduction that Arturo was going through. So with that, I'll hand it over to get um, shifting from a government perspective to a private sector perspective. Um, with Mo and Luz. Um, before we get into that, I just want to make um, a comment here that feel free to add questions in the chat. We've got some time reserved at the end for a Q&A. So as we're going through this, if any questions come up related to any of the speakers specifically or broadly the built for all framework that Arturo was introducing earlier, we'll be addressing those at the end. So feel free to drop them in and we'll be compiling um, and talking about them later. So with that, I'll hand over to Mo and Luz. Thanks, Whitney. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohamed Rizanul and I work at MasterCard. Uh, to provide some context as to how we fit into the inclusive growth agenda, I thought I'd talk a little bit about MasterCard's financial inclusion uh, work. Uh, so in 2015, MasterCard made a commitment to the World Bank to financially include 500 million individuals by 2020, a target that we are proud to say we achieved earlier this year. Uh, instead of resting on our laurels, however, we actually doubled down on that commitment and have um, now set another goal to, to add another 500 million underserved individuals to the digital economy uh, for a total of 1 billion people by 2025. Uh, in addition to that, we have a target to connect 50 million micro businesses to the digital economy as well by 2025. So there are many uh, teams uh, across MasterCard that contribute to this goal. Uh, it's a group effort across the world, of course. Uh, I'd like to present a little bit uh, the work that my team does. Uh, we, I am on the financial inclusion products and solutions team uh, that is part of our global consumer solutions group at MasterCard. Uh, if, if you go to the next slide, slide please. Um, so as you can see, there's a variety of teams. Uh, we collaborate across the organization. Uh, and as, as I was mentioning, we're based out of the core products organization. Uh, we support this 1 billion goal by creating commercial products and solutions uh, that are specifically meant for the underserved to empower them to adopt digital payments. Uh, and so they can move beyond the world of cash and help them drive more inclusive growth uh, by enabling these safe, secure, and convenient transactions that can also uh, deliver the full value of financial services to the underserved. Uh, in my particular work, I lead our work in digitizing payments in the agricultural supply chains. Uh, so for the last two years, we have been partnering with other players in the private sector to understand what it takes to digitize payments to smallholder farmers who are part of global supply chains uh, that reach across the world uh, and are part of uh, you know, um, these large global businesses that are interested in, in driving more sustainability in their supply chains. Uh, so that we can create more inclusive growth opportunities for those farmers who are underserved. This is based on the insight from the World Bank that there are 235 million people globally who are getting paid in cash for selling their agricultural product, uh, two thirds of whom own a mobile phone. So they are deemed uh, you know, ready to be digitized and uh, a large segment of people who could potentially be converted to uh, the banking system or to the financial, formal financial system. Um, Luz, if you'd like to also jump in and talk a little bit about uh, sure. your work. Yeah, just a compliment here. You see all the teams at MasterCard. Um, I lead our work in Latin America and the Caribbean for MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Um, one of the many teams, again, that, that kind of brings this work to life. Um, we're the philanthropic arm of the company. Um, and we, we work funding programs and research that, that helps to bolster our work in financial inclusion. So for example, um, we'll bring to bear other community partners or NGOs that work with um, and understand uh, those that are excluded from the financial mainstream, uh, whether that's the informal workers, the smallholder farmers, the micro and small businesses. Um, and really our view is that not all the elements of driving inclusive growth happens on the commercial side of the house. So at the center, on the philanthropic side of the house, we look for opportunities to fund programs that can help drive insights 
can drive lessons that can be shared more broadly. Um, I think we can go to the next slide and Mo will take that. Yeah, so just to pick up, you know, in terms of our approach, you know, to how we drive financial inclusion or build our solutions, uh, we take a very collaborative uh, diagnostic and human centered design approach with our private sector partners. And essentially, we have three basic pillars that we try to establish in our work. Um, the first one is on the issuing side is to, you know, enable access to these products, right, in terms of financial inclusion. Oftentimes, the challenge is just getting a, a financial product of some sort into a, an underserved person's hands. Um, in the work that I do in the agriculture sector, we work very closely with our issuing partners on the banking side, as well as our private sector partners uh, who are giving us access to these agricultural supply chains, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more further, just to provide that basic access to uh, the most appropriate product. We are also a product agnostic team. So we literally go from the ground up and understand the market in which our smallholder farmers are operating in and try to come up with the best solution, whether it's a mobile uh, money, what is a digital wallet or a, a traditional bank account. Uh, after taking care of the access side, we also look at the usage side of things, right? We try to create an acceptance ecosystem around that product so that once you have the tool in your hand to make payments, uh, that there are relevant use cases for that underserved person to be able to use and get the full benefit of financial services. So it's not enough just to provide the access, but also to give them the means for you know, meaningful usage. So, you know, is there a way for them to pay their bills? Uh, do they need to pay school fees? How do they buy their agro inputs, for example? Um, are there merchants in the neighborhood or nearby where they live who can help them access cash when needed? Uh, how can we digitize uh, th you know, those kinds of transactions that make that solution meaningful. So there again, we work with another host of private sector players. So either people who help us create these micro merchant solutions to, to enable digital acceptance of payments, uh, as well as with the merchants themselves who are often micro merchants and, and small businesses themselves. The third pillar is all about engagement. Uh, and again, we work with uh, very closely with the Center for Inclusive Growth here to uh, create a program that will uh, engage with these underserved users and provide basic education on, uh, on literacy, uh, financial literacy, to do a needs assessment of where their financial literacy levels are, and then to create a program that helps them uh, migrate from the world of cash to the solution that we are proposing. Uh, this is, of course, a, a very complex process. It, it, it requires a lot of handholding, and I think uh, from everything from basic knowledge, like, you know, how to use a card or how to use an ATM all the way down to how to save money or how to plan for a future goal. Uh, these are the three basic pillars we try to build uh, whenever we, we, we launch a solution. And I think, you know, it illustrates a little bit our, our partnership within the organization as well. You know, when we, when we go to the payment product side, we, we, we go to our colleagues who are on the, on the uh, issuing side of the business or who work with our issuers, our account managers on the, on the acceptance side, we work with our acceptance teams our local product teams, and then of course in the center for the consumer engagement piece, we work very closely with the center and, and their NGO partners who help us implement those programs. Um, uh, a little bit, uh, next slide please, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the collaborative effort that this all requires and how we align, uh, you know, our goals. You know, we come at this from various perspectives, but all focused on building a more inclusive economy. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of how we align with our private sector partners, you know, the, this concept of business sustainability, uh, I think really, really illustrates this idea of an inclusive economy very well, especially from a private sector point of view. You know, there are many businesses around the world uh, that are understanding now that their success and their future business success, their future financial returns depend on the, the success of their suppliers as well, the long chain of suppliers that provide the raw materials to their business. That in fact, everyone has to benefit from the growth of uh, the private sector businesses down that value chain in order for everyone to succeed. We're all kind of linked in that value chain. So the way we initially aligned with the private sector is exactly along these uh, inclusive growth agenda, you know, you know uh, this, this agenda where all parties in the value chain have to benefit from the value being created by that value chain. Um, so this is usually around, you know, our uh, corporate sustainability goals in the private sector. So a lot of companies will uh, have goals about increasing the income of farmer, smallholder farmers. Uh, a lot of companies are, are interested in the sustainable and ethical sourcing side of the business. A lot of their consumers, uh, the end consumers of their products are also interested in this. And then also fostering greater transparency and um, uh, traceability in the supply chain has also been 
a major uh, focus for most of the world and consumers increasingly over the past few years. The other um, uh, alignment that needs to take place, you know, we are a global team, so we create global partnerships, but when we implement solutions, we have to go into, uh, into regions and specific markets. And uh, that also is a collaborative effort, both internally to us at MasterCard, where we try to identify markets where we have the right assets to address this kind of issue, as well as our private sector partner telling us where they have specific pain points in trying to digitize payments, for example. Um, the, the, this whole effort, you know, with us working with the private sector is a very, very collaborative effort. Uh, as, as you know, uh, as you probably know, MasterCard does not have a lot of experience in managing agricultural supply chains and vice versa for our private sector partners when it comes to the payments world or the payments ecosystem. So there's a lot of time and effort that's put in the initial um, uh, phases of this partnership that we create to do some domain knowledge sharing. It's a very, very collaborative effort where we learn about all about the sourcing and procurement uh, side of the agricultural business, uh, sorry, the agricultural supply chain business, as well as understanding the pain points of the farmers on the ground. And in our diagnostic process, we actually go to the exact location, meet with farmers, meet with the suppliers or the traders on the ground who are doing the procurement. At the same time, we also share our knowledge on setting up a digital payments ecosystem, uh, trying to understand um, you know, uh, what the pain points are of the farmers, but also trying to educate the people uh, who want to digitize payments and also want to become part of the digital ecosystem, what it takes to digitize. Um, implementation as well on the ground is also a very, very much, is a very much a collaborative effort. We need to pull in uh, not only uh, team members from our private sector partner, but we have to work with merchants, we have to work with payment facilitators. We also have to work with the, the NGOs that are helping us with consumer engagement. And it's a very, very uh, stakeholder intensive process. Um, but I think the, the main challenge here is all of us aligning on, on seeing that sustainable growth and sustainable uh, and inclusive growth is part of the agenda that benefits all those stakeholders together. And everyone has to see a benefit and value. And that's one of the main challenges, I think, from the private sector um, in, in terms of in, uh, implementing an inclusive growth agenda. Uh, to give you a, a specific example of this partnership approach that we've put into, con into application, uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a partnership with the Norman Cafe Group uh, based in Germany. Uh, they're the world's largest coffee trader um, and are interested in improving the smallholder coffee farmers' lives uh, in their uh, supply chains uh, because they have a very, very clear view on how their future business performance is dependent on the uh, success and growth of the farmers who provide the raw materials, uh, the green coffee. Uh, so for example, we have been in Mexico for the last two years piloting our solution and our approach. Um, and to give you a bit of a context in Mexico, you know, the 85% of, uh, of the market in, in coffee production in Mexico is based on smallholder farmers. This is a multi-billion dollar business globally, but it is based on, uh, I think globally actually, 80 90% of the producers are actually smallholder coffee farmers, not large producers. Uh, Mexico is no different. Uh, at the same time, the average age of a coffee farmer in Mexico is approaching, is, is above 50, is sometimes approaching 60 or 70. And the, the market is aging and the younger generations are not joining into the coffee business. So NKG quite, astutely understands that the future, you know, in 30, 40 years of their business depends on there being a vibrant generation of, uh, of uh, coffee farmers and uh, increasing growth of coffee farming. Uh, in our approach in implementing these three pillars on the ground, we are working with our local issuing partners, Banco Azteca, uh, as well as uh, City Banamex as our key partners on the issuing side. And Fondação Capital is the NGO that's helping us work uh, with the consumer engagement side. Uh, we are also working with the local subsidiary of NKG uh, called Explotora de Café California to create a digital payment solution and a training program to onboard these farmers. Uh, we are using a type two debit uh, accounts and a low cost micro merchant solution for, for uh, about 200 merchants in the area to help serve those farmers. Now, the, the main step, the main first step of the program project is to digitize the payments that Norman Cafe Group is making to farmers to buy coffee from them. But we think of this as a pathway. We think of this as a stepping stone towards broader financial inclusion. Um, and after two years, what we've been able to do is create a direct digital payment solution that allows NKG to trade directly with farmers, which allows them to target more smallholder farmers directly instead of relying on middlemen 
and aggregators in the market that actually take a share of income away from the smallholder farmers. Uh, when NKG first started talking to us, they told us literally the main barrier between us and doing between us and the smallholder farmer doing more direct trade is that we need to have a direct method, payment method. Um, Luz, I don't know if you'd like to also talk a little bit about uh, some of the yeah. high level uh, learnings that we've had in Mexico. Yeah, and I think the, the only thing I'd add here is that um, really the lack of trust in institutions and financial exclusion runs pretty deep um, in these rural communities. I don't think you know we were naive enough to think that you know, just by creating a product that it would immediately solve for all of that. So um, what we did do is try to, again, introduce a new actor into this project, into this private sector value chain, an NGO named uh, Fundacion Capital, um, and they, with their field experience in, in the market um, that they brought to the table, um, were able to build some local capacity through a peer-to-peer -peer training program. Um, so really trying to leverage their existing social capital in the region um, they're also able to build trust and bust myths um, and developing some uh, content around that um, and really spending time in community. Um, they're able to provide, again, savings and financial education alongside uh, the product with a combination of what we, we call um, tech and touch. So that in-person, but also following up with SMS, um, doing a rotational tablet program that they've instituted in other um, vulnerable communities. Um, but I think probably most importantly, um, the, they helped us document lessons and feedback about um, some of the gaps and the challenges um, that could continue to exist after we're implementing um, this project. And I think a, a partner like that really allowed us to, to not only be transparent about what we're learning, but also gain that real understanding of how people could benefit from a, a more inclusive economy. Um, Mo, if you want to take us through some really, I know we're kind of getting short on time here, maybe just yes. really quickly through the next slide and then we can. Just to wrap up on our final slide, to, to address some of the barriers we've encountered and challenges we've encountered to getting to scale and in our work in building more inclusive economies. You know, as I was mentioned, just to go through the, the quickly through the three pillars on the, on the issuing and payment product side, you know, farmer outreach and onboarding has been uh, a high touch uh, activity that takes a lot of time and cost. You know, just being able to reach your segment, to bring them into the formal economy, to educate them in a way, to build that awareness of the product and to tell them what it's all about takes a lot of time. Uh, onboarding farmers into a payment product uh, requires a lot of time as well. You know, being able to do it in remote areas from the field, you know, digitally is also a key requirement. It's also a very complicated process sometimes depending on local regulations. On the acceptance and ecosystem side, you know, uh, working with small micro merchants who are perhaps, uh, you know, accepting digital payments for the first time, that's also a challenge. You know, onboarding them and bringing them into and activating them into the into the digital economy has also been a challenge. Um, you know, we also see that usage has to be incentivized on both the customer consumer side as well as the merchant side, um, and and these are things that take time for people to understand and to get used to, uh, and to see the full benefit of. Uh, and the consumer engagement side, I would say, you know, the timing was very critical of when we went and approached farmers, right? Um, training must be provided in a specific context with a specific use case tied to a specific pain point so that people understand why there's a benefit for them to adopt a digital payment. And as Luz was mentioning, there's a lot of mistrust and fear as well, a lot of myth and misconceptions, you know, uh, it's amazing. Sometimes farmers didn't even understand that banks can provide, you know, tools to help you save, not just provide credit, you know, things, very basic things like that were, were key barriers. Um, and then the market and project level, you know, uh, you know, finding enough resources on the ground to implement these projects, to manage all the stakeholders, to coordinate all the different agendas takes a lot of effort and time as well as the project management that's required in the field. Um, and then I think in, in, you know, in the basic, these are the basic challenges of financial inclusion, you know, the market dynamics, the, and the pain points of every, uh, every uh, stakeholder as well as trying to organize all and align all the objectives has been one of the key barriers to getting to scale. And we're right at that inflection point now, having learned a lot of different things and we're trying to figure out how do we take this to the next level. Um, Luz, I don't know if you'd like to add, I think uh, that- Yeah, just to, yeah just to quickly close out, I, you know, our, our hope is that by generating and sharing some of these lessons and open sourcing some of the tools, actually we've open sourced all our consumer engagement tools um, with the digital toolkit. Um, the hope is that it allows us to reach and engage more audiences as, as we wrestle with scale. So whether that's working with the federal government that's looking for solutions in the rural sector, 
because they're worried that the pandemic's increasing digital divides, whether it's a multilateral organization that's looking to finance or scale solutions, um, other private sector companies, many have approached us wanting to learn more or development practitioners um, that are looking to other agricultural sectors for these kinds of opportunities. I think it allows us to, to really start building more of a multi-sector uh, approach for scaling an inclusive economy. So I think we'll leave it there in terms of um, our approach. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Mo. Thank you, Luz. Um, that was really great. And I really like those points that you made with regard to overcoming distrust um, and partnership and collaboration in terms of doing that. I know that a lot of folks on this call commented on um, lack of legitimacy or declining trust as a barrier that they were facing to build inclusive economies as well. So uh, with that, I'll hand it on to our third speaker, um, Frederick Riley, who will give us um, his perspective from a civic sector as, as opposed to the government and private sector perspectives that we've heard so far. So good morning and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I know back and forth about what I would say during the time um, because there's so many different inroads to how I could approach the topic from the civic sector. Um, I currently serve as the executive director of Weave, the social fabric project at the Aspen Institute. And our explicit goal is to really help people in communities who are on the ground helping to build our nation's social trust. Social trust right now in our communities around the country are dwindling and are at some all time lows. But what I would, I guess what I would add to that is, is what the pandemic has brought up and what it has helped to uh, shine a light on is that in communities of black and brown people, more importantly from the communities I've lived in, for black people, social trust has never been there in the systems um, because understanding the exclusion from economic systems, you have to know the history and what has happened to um, in black and brown communities when folks have tried to get ahead from, if you look at after the civil war during reconstruction, the largest number of people, of men and women who were lynched throughout the South were business owners, right? And so they were, let's kill the competition um, lest they be, get involved in the economic system. So let's kill them off. And then when the grotesque lynchings of people around the country became too much to bear, we started enacting systems, right? These, these, uh, these laws and legislation to keep people out of the financial system. So you go to Tulsa and you burn down the entire, what they call at the time, the Black Wall Street. And so now we start redlining, right? And if you look at how these systems have like have changed what our communities look like, it's if you look at to, um, the city of St. Louis, North St. Louis and South St. Louis, the difference in that community is one community is a primarily black community and the other community is a primarily white community. White soldiers who came home from World War II were given $5,000 in a GI Bill. They went off and they took the, that GI Bill and they bought homes. They, from those homes, they created a half a million dollars in equity and they sent their kids to colleges, law schools and medical schools. And then they bought bigger homes and they educated themselves and they built generational wealth. Black soldiers who fought alongside in the same war and died at the same rates came home and got nothing. And so they went back to the same neighborhoods they were from. And so there was never this investment. And so they were then excluded from the system. And so how do you trust a system that was never built for you, that never ex that never held your best interest? And if you look at things like uh, the after soldiers came home from the Civil War, Black soldiers were told to put their money in the free Freeman's Bank. They put their money in a Freeman's Bank later to have it stolen. And so there's no trust. And so if there's no trust, there can never ever, or any, if there's never any reconciliation of the past, there can never ever be any trust that's built in a system that we know has historically excluded us. And the current reality we're in right now is because of those years, right? Where folks were building the foundation and we're never able to build the foundation. If you look at all our social issues we have right now from crime to homelessness, to our education system, to all these culminating issues, there's one core issue right in the middle of that, and it is poverty. Um, and poverty is the thing that kind of like strickens all of those issues. And it's kind of like the springboard that sprites all these flowers that are coming out. And so how do we how do we begin to fix that? And so around the country, I worked for about 15 years for YMCAs all around the country. And the one culminating thing that we're all working on these small 
of cause issues that were caused because of the root. And so we're working on edu educating, we're working on health issues, we're working on all these different things. We're not really attacking the root cause of them. We're not corralling ourselves together to say together, if we decide to unite as one united front, we could really fight the root cause of these issues. So we're all like fighting the same war, but we're attacking it separately. And if there's never a person or a group or a lens to which you kind of corral all this work together, we'll never ever find this inroads to a system, right? That will help our communities to grow. So we're all fighting these separate priorities, fighting for the same funds, stepping all over each other to fight poverty or to fight these one issues that never really attack the, the core of the problem. I think the civic sector, the civic sector is working hard to address these things, but it has to be, if we're ever going to have a road ahead, it has to be some shared collective vision on how we can all begin to unite together. So I'll give an example. We know that um, in this country, a college degree will earn a young person an extra million dollars over the course of their career. So if you're working on third grade reading and you're working on health disparity and you're working on this, how about we all figure out how, if we're all working on the educating of youth, that we are all working to send young people to college. And I know somebody will say, oh, every kid is in, a, is in college material, and I agree, but the skills that they, that they will learn on the trajectory ahead is going to be transferable to the military, if they open a business, but also applicable to college. And so we have to figure out how do we work together in the system to, to move it forward. I think when we think about trust, we have to figure out how do you own the past, right? You own the past, you apologize it, and you create these barriers to never go back there, right? And then as you begin to craft the road ahead, you have to craft the road ahead with the same people that you kicked out of the system to begin with, right? So oftentimes we go into these communities with these fancy words, these fancy products, these fancy PowerPoints, and we say, hey, we're gonna help you get involved in the system. But I'm like going, wait a minute, this is the same place that stole my money from Freedman's Bank. This is the same place that burned down Tulsa. This is the same place that did, did this. How do you expect me to come alongside you to be a part of this system? And so folks are opting out. And so if you want folks to opt in, you have to build along with them. Because I'll tell you, in our work around the country, we have found that communities and people within these communities know what's best needed for their communities. They just need the capital. They just need the access and they just need these support systems to help those products that they're having to grow. The next thing I would say is the consumable measures, right? I like to say that um, we build these pies and we bake them really high up in the sky. Um, and once they're done, we put them, instead of putting them on a cooling rack, we throw them out the window and they splat everywhere. But if you really want people to get a slice of that pie, and that pie is like the American dream, you want to bake it high in the sky, you want to put it on a system and lower it down to the ground, slice it up and hand it to the individual so that they can eat that pie and consume it. But if you make this pie so high up and nobody understands how to get a part of it, it'll be it'll just be there. And I think we have to like create consumable measures for people to be able to tap into. The last thing is is really understanding what all of this means to people who live every day. I think it's one thing, you know, I've, I have a couple of degrees under my belt, so I understand the system. I know how to navigate the system a little better, right? Um, but the notion that people who live on Main Street don't, we have to figure out how to stop talking about Wall Street, but to talk about how the work of Wall Streets affect people on Main Street. People who live in communities, this is the community work and people who live in neighborhoods, it's the most important place, right? I once heard a, a representative say to me, you know, local community work is the most important work. It's because it's where people have babies. It's where they buy groceries. It's where they die. It's where they buy homes. It's where they, it's where they live. And so if we're often talking about these measures for like government and what it means for our economy to grow, Folks don't recognize what that means for them in the neighborhood that they live in. And so our systems, our systems or what we create have to be consumable, but it also has to make sense for people who live at the ground level, at the community level. So thank you. Megan, I think you might be muted actually. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. I had to do the unplug and replug. 
But um, again, thanks to all of our speakers. It was really great to hear just the different perspectives from the three huge sectors that we identify in our, our, in our report as having the keys to really unlocking inclusive economies. And it was really great to hear the reiterated themes across all of them that just reinforce how important um, collaboration and working together really is. I think one of the more interesting things, one of the interesting things you heard was just this idea of collaboration and how that operates at different scales. We heard about in, in cities that needs to be drilled down to the neighborhood level. Frederick and um, Jeremiah both spoke about how important it is to connect to the person in their immediate community to be able to come up with solutions that they feel they're a part of and can actually see operating in their own community. While in Mexico, we're working with a huge scale of coffee farmers that haven't um, necessarily collaborated to work with these big businesses that they're trying to sell their um, their products to. And this, uh, this idea of how you identify at what scale the collaboration needs to occur is something I think a lot of us struggle with and what that right level of um, of inclusion and collaboration is can be pretty tricky. Um, we also heard a lot about how important collaboration is to changing the status quo, right? This community of farmers working together to change how they completely do business is something that's really hard for one or two people to do at a time when you're able to organize a large sector with con or a large group of people with common interests. That ability to change the status quo and really take a big step forward is much easier. We also heard about that in the civic sector and cities working to build it, build that narrative to really address the root cause and build a collective vision that we can bring people along with. Um, and the last thing I got from this just to share is that the most important thing partnerships can do is build trust and leverage social capital that already exists. Um, I love Frederick's point, he, he's made a few times about need, people wanting to opt into the system. We can create a, the perfect framework and describe the perfectly, a perfectly inclusive economy, but if people don't see themselves in it and don't choose to be a part of it and choose to believe that that is possible, we're never going to get there. We need everyone's buy-in, everyone's energy, everyone's excitement to really get, um, to really build inclusive economies in our communities and across the world. So that, I that we saw in like the tech and touch model, how much groundwork is needed in Mexico to really make sure that um, the farmers under and understood the benefits of what was happening and how they could fully participate and benefit from, from it. Um, and all the field activities we do there and how cities and the civic sector engage their residents. So um, those are, yeah, that's, <laughs> sorry. Um, those are just three of the main things that I took away of how important it is to work together and just um, wanted to reinforce what our speakers have already said, which is there's no way one sector fixes all of the existing problems at once, right? This is all about how every sector and every person has a unique and special role that they need to step in and fill for any, in order for us to build um, an inclusive economy together. So we can move to the next slide. So um, we appreciate everyone joining the session that filled out this question we had during your sign up of what's a con what's a problem you're experiencing that um, the we could look at the framework to use as a as a way to rethink the problem and move towards a solution and we really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out uh, due to time constraints we can't go through the whole exercise right now but uh, appreciate all of your input as we move on to, as we move forward with this framework, now that we have the academic creation of it done, the work that CPI and CIG is re are really excited about is figuring out what this does look like. What are the problems people in the field are experiencing that um, like we see in the polls we did earlier, or we wanna do more with interviews of people on the ground. Where are the biggest holes in this framework? Where can we learn more about um, specific solutions that can uh, result in just a lower level, more strategic thinking framework. So we, yeah, sorry, we're out of time for this section, but everyone on our team is really energized about how we move this down to that level to um, use this framework to start solving real problems and work with partners like you all across across sectors around the country and world to really start building the inclusive economy. So I encourage you all to 
keep in touch and um yeah and keep building building for all where it's not we don't consider this framework built and done but the act of building an inclusive economy is work that we're just getting started doing and are really excited to partner and work on that journey with you so i'm going to pass over to whitney to do our um, final wrap-up activity uh so whitney take it away perfect thanks megan and so Shifting gears a little bit to looking ahead, sort of what things can we all do to continue building inclusive economies moving forward? We're going to do a little bit of an activity here and then also break into our Q&A. So if Brian, you could move on to the next slide. Um, what the broader government aftershock event is doing is that during each of these local sessions, um, there everyone is asking these same three questions. So. And the three questions are, what will we keep? What will we leave behind? And what will we do differently? So as you think about answering these, we'll be doing a word cloud on Mentimeter, that same tool that you used for the poll earlier in the session. So if you go back to your phone, your desktop, onto the website menti.com using this code, you can go ahead and answer in questions. And you should think about the answers to these questions in terms of, based on what we talked about today, the experiences and the stories that you heard, what are the types of behaviors, activities, values, mindsets, things that you want to keep moving forward that will help you build an inclusive economy? What are the types of things that you want to leave behind, perhaps consider stop doing? And what are the types of things that you'll want to do differently? So if you go ahead on your phones, um, you can fill those out. Um, you've got the ability to fill in up to three words for each word cloud, um, and then you can move on to the next one and the next one after that. So it'll give you time to do that thinking, but in the meantime, um, we'll actually go ahead and start answering some of your questions. So in the next 10 minutes or so, take your time, fill in the words for each of those word clouds, um, and we'll return back to those word clouds. But in the meantime, we'll go ahead and answer some of the questions that we got um, throughout the discussion. So I'll let Megan moderate that Q&A portion and direct some of the questions. I know we had some specifically for our different speakers and some just broadly for the presentation overall. Um, but I'll let Megan go ahead and start there, and then we'll return to the word clubs at the end as a wrap up for the final five minutes. So, Brian, you want to hop back to the PowerPoint slide for the Q&A, and then we'll get back to those word clubs at the end. But go ahead and fill those in in the background. Great. Thanks, Whitney. So the first question, we'll go back to Jeremiah. Um, we were asked, how are you measuring progress against towards your objectives in Grand Rapids? That's a good question. So um, we let me give you a specific example. So one of the things I mentioned earlier was this inclusion policy that we um, are taking, uh, we are approving here in, in uh, December. The importance there is we're partnering with our Office of Equity and Engagement and the outcomes that we're tracking there specifically are um, increasing the number and, and the capacity, more importantly, of um, MBEs, WBEs, and MLBEs, contractors that are registered with the city to take advantage of um, development opportunities that the city is leading, public, pro publicly funded projects, and um, privately funded projects to serve as the um, liaison to introducing um, them to those folks bringing um, uh, forward develop, private development projects that have re, that we have, um, I would say that we can't have requirements that we have suggested and, and raised expectations that they increase minority contractors in the development process. And so we're measuring that by the number of those that are, that are um, uh, registering as um, MBEs and uh, WBEs and MLBEs and then tracking that year over year by the number and then tracking the projects that they were involved in in total number of, um, I'm gonna say, investment that those projects are related to. I, I'd say the other piece too is we are also, um, our commitment in our strategic plan is this aggregating all our data by race, ethnicity and the like. And so those demographics can be um, reported out. And so. Um, one success measure that we've seen, as I um, mentioned, into those neighborhood areas. So in our, each neighborhood areas, we have corridor improvement authorities, and they collect tax increment revenues based on um, projects that take place over um, year over year and the incremental, I'm going to say, property value increase. 
And I'm happy to report that in our third ward, which is one of those areas on the census tracts that, um, that is a neighborhood of focus, um, this year, um, they um, collected out of all six other um, uh, corridor improvement authorities, the highest increment tax, uh, the tax increment of all areas of the city, the highest by almost double. And so now the, one of the lowest disinvested areas of the city now has one of the highest budget balances to invest, again, the incremental development, to invest in other development projects within their ward. So we see that as a huge success. And now they're you know, coming from a place that had the traditionally been the area that had disinvestment to one of the areas that has the highest and now um, are uh, able to invest in other projects um, that are being done by locals, uh, business owners and residents in the neighborhood. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you. Um, the next question we got is, can we please address the role of public education, ensuring that every child has the same educational opportunities? Also, can you address the role, if any, of regional government? So I'll start with um, the role of regional government. So that, I think they step in in a broader st strategic planning sense. Uh, cities are often much larger than their legal limits, right? Um, I'm based in D.C. and our suburbs cross two additional states. So there's a lot to coordinate to achieve the goals that Jeremiah has talked about, especially transportation, right? Um, I also lived in Philly and the Southeast Pennsylvania Transit Authority covers so many different types of, so many different districts and even types of districts, the city of Philadelphia, the suburbs that go out deep out into Pennsylvania. So there's definitely a role there in just the organization of the community as a large, as, as a whole. And there's also the role of regions that might not have a center metropolitan powerhouse to group their resources together and do larger pool those resources and um, yeah make decisions together for the entire region that's something we're seeing a little more of but is just always been more difficult because the more stakeholders you involve in a decision the harder it is to get to that consensus so i think that's a way that we're those are ways that we're seeing regional governments step up and uh, take that broader strategic role and put the vision for everyone in the area rather than dependent on the city or county line they, they legally reside in. Um, as to education, um, that's something we see is just so core to any, any vision or growth. It's impossible to economically plan if no one's able to do the jobs in that city after that plan is made. So that's where education steps in. Um, this is something we studied a lot in our CPI's work on the West Philadelphia Skills Initiative last year. Um, the Economic Development Authority worked very closely with um, educators in the region to make sure that the areas that are growing, the businesses that are growing, are able to hire local residents with the skill sets they need to help those businesses and those individuals thrive. And that's something um, I'm from Erie and their plan, they have gotten a lot of attention for their opportunity zone planning and are trying to reorient themselves as a tech hub. And what goes along with that is making sure that the students and young people in the region have the tech skills that the businesses they want to attract have. So businesses are more likely to move to places where workers that fit their requirements already exist than to try and build that infrastructure from scratch. So um, education is, we see is like an inherent, something that has inherent good in itself but it's also really essential for anyone trying to think about economic development or building an inclusive economy. Um, I'll leave some space for any of our speakers if they want to add on to that question. Yeah, I'd add to that. I think part of the public education is attacking is attacking how you, the system and how you even fund public education institutions, right? So I'll give an example in the state of Pennsylvania, um, you have a, a small historically black college like Cheney, um, and then you have Penn State, right? And so Penn State gets more state funding for their school because they have a higher graduation rate. And so because Cheney has a lower graduation rate, um, they get less funding. And so the funding mechanism is all based on the number of young people you graduate. So a smaller school, you 
every school is going to have some attrition rate. Folks are going to drop off and not graduate, right? So junior year is the key. Um, but at a Penn State where most of the kids who come there were on the track to graduate from college when they got there, it's like an unequal advantage for funding. So make the playing field the same, right? Make the dollar the same. Give everybody the same resources and you'll have different results. But we keep these archaic and most of the time racist systems in place to really really keep people out of the system. So if you keep the plan field equal, folks will rise up to it. But often we just keep these same archaic systems in place just because it's how we've done it before. Yeah, that's a really good point about funding specifically. And just, again, this need to push question and work together to change the status quo. Um, so recognize that we only have three minutes left in our event. We're going to um, move from question and answers over to the word cloud. If we get through that and have more time, we'll get to the last few. But again, thanks for inputting um, all your questions and answers. So Perfect. Whitney, do you so, want to walk us through? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so just, just wanted to wrap up with some themes that we saw through the word cloud. So how these work, in case folks aren't familiar with them, if people enter the same word, that word gets larger and gets centered within the image here. So in the service of what we will keep, some themes, and I would agree, I think I heard this a lot throughout the presentation, seeing a lot of collaboration, continuing to collaborate both internally within your organization, and I'm assuming also, also across sector with other partners, across sectors with other partnerships. Learning from failures, understanding, experimenting, um, continuing to push forward and innovating and finding new ideas, um, I think are great takeaways from this session in terms of what we will keep. And then if Brian, if you wanna to go to the next slide, in terms of what we'll leave behind, Seeing some themes here in terms of silos, I'm assuming that communication silos, um, just trying to make sure along the theme of collaboration, making sure that folks are talking um, and working together to solve these issues that we all agree are really problematic and causing a lack of growth really in our economies. Um, exclusion, and you can see a couple other things here, discrimination, segregation or exclusion, a lot of similar themes that are coming through in terms of the types of things that we want to leave behind. Some short-termism in there, which was a big theme in Jeremiah's presentation as well, trying to make sure that we're prioritizing and incentivizing for focus and strategy directed at the long term. And then lastly, um, just want to touch a little bit on what we'll do differently. Um, seeing quite a few themes here, the big thing will be our cross-sectoral partnerships, which I think is a great one and hopefully was exemplified through the perspectives that we had from our governments, our private sector, and our civic sector in all the different ways that they've been working to build inclusive economies. Um, localized power, I think, is another great one, especially from the case example that we heard from Mo and Luce um, with overcoming a lack of trust and overcoming um, a lack of legitimacy and working with local partners to really make sure that your solutions work best for those folks and also garner the trust that you need for folks to embrace it. So I think that that's great. Um, investing, listening, learning, I think these are all really great takeaways. Um, to continue moving forward in building inclusive economy. So wanted to wrap up with that. Those are three um, questions that everyone throughout Aftershock are being asked. And so I know tomorrow, if you're joining the broader two-day session, they'll be connecting some of those things that they heard throughout the presentation, all of their presentations broadly today, um, and bringing those together in tomorrow's session. So I um, wanted to wrap up with that. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate your time, your engagement, your questions. Um, as was mentioned in the chat, a recording will be available on the CPI YouTube channel. We'll also be sharing it. Um, but please feel free to follow up with us if you've got any questions or other things that you want to engage on. But thank you again, everyone, for your time, our speakers for your time presenting, and everyone for your engagement.